We are looking back this year on 80 years of Acre Gospel Mission. As I've said, 53, 54 years in which we've been associated with this work. And we thank God for his faithfulness over the years. The Apostle Paul was always conscious that in the work of God, he not only depended on the promises of God, how much we all need those promises. Hudson Taylor it was who said, we have 25 cents and all the promises of God, and that's enough. Not only do we depend on the promises of God, but also on the power of the God of God. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. But the Apostle Paul also, as he wrote to those Corinthians, he reminded them that he was very much depending on the people of God. He was in Asia, and he spoke of being pressed out of measure, above strength, even despairing of life itself. But the people in Europe, he wrote these words, but you also helping to gather by prayer unto God for us. And so in Acre Gospel Mission, we thank God for the people of God, those who stood by this work for all these years, praying for the work, supporting this work, and we give thanks to the Lord. We're turning this morning to a familiar portion of Scripture, Psalm 126. Perhaps it's already been read during this week, but it is very much a psalm that is uh, uppermost in our minds on this, the 80th anniversary of Acre Gospel Mission. And it simply says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And amen, God always blesses to us the reading of his sacred word. When I read this psalm, I'm reminded of an American election campaign. Uh, as the last one for President Trump, it was a long and expensive campaign. And when the result was finally declared, there was a lot of celebration, as the Americans would do, a lot of razzmatazz that went to the early hours of the morning. When they were almost finished, the celebration, the president-elect stood up, and he thanked all the supporters, those who had stood by him. And he said these words, he says, Ladies and gentlemen, hats off to the past, coats off for the future. I say that is the sentiment of this little psalm because this little, this little psalm is doing exactly that. It is looking back with gratitude for all that God has done. The great thing, so much so that he says that he feels like he's dreaming, laughing, singing. There is that sense of joy in the gratitude for all that God has done. But not only gratitude for all that has passed, it is very much the psalm coats off to the future for not only looking back with joy and singing and dreaming and laughter, but looking forward with tears and sowing and heartache. And he says this word, he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, he shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And the whole future of this work depends on that word, doubtless. My friend, thank God we can look back with gratitude to God and all that he has done. But we can look forward with the sense of guarantee, in, in the sense that there is a doubtless. Why? Because he faileth not. God is absolutely faithful and we thank God for the promises that we've proved. His love in times past forbids us to think. He leaves us at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer we have in review confirms the sweet promise. He'll help us quite through. There is gratitude for the past. There is a sense of guarantee for the future. Let me speak about the gratitude for the past. We're looking back on the work of Acre Gospel Mission for 80 years. And it is quite amazing that this work really did not go out to be founded as a mission. 
when Mr. and Mrs. McComb, who had already been in Brazil from 1926, when they felt that God was calling them to the Acre. The Acre was the most distant part of Brazil, 2,500 miles from the mouth of the Amazon River. They were working with Unevangelized Fields Mission, and the mission headquarters was at Belém, at the mouth of the Amazon. When William McComb heard about the need in the Acre from culpiters, no missionaries there, he asked the mission for permission to go there. They said, it's too far away. We can't administer it. And so Willie felt that he should step down from the mission and as an individual go to the Acre. There was no Acre Gospel mission. He didn't go to find a mission. As a matter of fact, on the Shankill Road at the Northumberland Street Mission Hall, as they shared the burden of what God had put in their heart, and word had come back of the terrible price that had been paid by the three Freds who had been murdered on the Shingu by the Kayapa Indians, why the challenge was even more acute in his heart to go to the Acre. It was calling out. Molly Harvey. Molly Harvey felt that she should join the McCombs, and uh, they said to her, you, you better go and have a medical because we're going to a very precarious part of the Amazon. Molly went to a doctor and was examined by the doctor, and the doctor listened to her heart, and he said, Miss Harvey, you're going to an area that's known as the Green Hill. There's no medical assistance, and I advise you not to go. If you go there, you'll not last for more than a year with your heart condition. Molly was shattered, disappointed, so much so that she went back to the second doctor. The second doctor confirmed what the first doctor said. She went to a third doctor, and a fourth, and a fifth. And they all confirmed to Molly Harvey that going to the green hill of the Amazon in that remote part of the Amazon, the Acre, why she would never survive and therefore don't go. But Molly's conviction was far greater than the doctor's advice, and Molly did go. She didn't go for a year. She went for more than 30 years. When Molly Harvey came home at 65 years of age, all of the doctors were dead, and Molly lived on to 92. And uh, she just proved that God was faithful. They went out in 1937 to the Amazon, to the Acre, uh, the three of them. And in the course, they were planning to be home in 1940. As a matter of fact, to Mr. and Mrs. McComb, it was a big price to pay to go back to the Amazon because they had to leave at home their four-year-old daughter, Arlene. They left Arlene with the family down in Belly Walter, the county down in the Irish Peninsula, promising that we will be back in three to four years and we will just form the family again. But we know the story now. They didn't get home because war came. Molly Harvey says she will never forget the day that uh, Margaret McComb handed over her four-year-old daughter to the family in Belly Walter, and suddenly the door of the car slammed, and that was it. They didn't see their daughter again for more than nine years. The little girl that they left at four years of age was now 13 when they got home. And why was that? Simply because when war came, they couldn't leave the Amazon. They couldn't get out of that part of Brazil. They were stuck in the north of Brazil. And though they tried to get home in many ways, it was too dangerous, and all international travel was suspended, and therefore the Combs were there. Not only could they not renew uh, by, uh, bonds with their family, they also couldn't get funds out because they weren't a mission. They were just individuals. And so it was in 1940 when the it was impossible to send funds to individuals abroad. At the Northern Bank, at the front of the City Hall, some interested friends got together with the bank manager and said, we, we need to send money to these people. How can we do it? He said, they need to have a mission organization. Well, we don't have a mission organization. He said, well, let's make one. Where are they working? They're working in Acre. Well, he said, we'll just register this account under Acre Gospel Mission that will give to us the means of sending money to Brazil. And so it was, the Acre Gospel Mission was born in the Northern Bank at the front of the City Hall. No one had gone out to start a mission. As a matter of fact, when the war was finished and the McCombs were able to get home, they came home absolutely broken in health, not being able to return to Brazil again. 
They come home to try and repair the bonds, the broken bonds of a family and receive their daughter of 13. To all intents and purposes, that was the end of Acre Gospel Mission, except for the fact that Miss Harvey, in her heart, there was beating that burden for the people of the Acre, the people that she had loved and served and led many of them to the Lord, and as a midwife had brought many of them into the world. And so it was that having gone home in 1946, in 1948, she felt that she should return to the Amazon. And in 1948, Acre Gospel Mission was embodied in one person, Molly Harvey. What a pioneer Molly was. She not only traveled to the Amazon, she went to the town of Santa Madureira, right in the heart of the Acre, and there working with Norwegian missionaries, she established the work. As she wrote home, James and Dory Gunning, their hearts were touched down there in Newton Ards. James was a foreman in a building firm, but he felt God tugging in his heart, and therefore he stepped out of his employment, did Bible college. And in 1949, James and Dory Gunning sailed to Brazil. It was a long trip. As a matter of fact, when he got to the city of Manaus, already a thousand miles up the Amazon, James and Dory embarked on a little river steamer and were on that steamer for 48 days, sitting on, tops, uh, on top of, of bales of, uh, of rubber and uh, bags of rice, and that's how it was. And when they got to Santa Madureira, oh, Dory's ankles were already swollen. She never recovered from it for the rest of her life. It was a perilous and, and treacherous time. Thereafter, that work began to grow. Not only James and Dory Gunning, but then Jack Finley from Dundonald, a couple from Liverpool, and then Fred Ord and his wife in 1954, they joined him, and we know the story. Having arrived in Brazil early in May and wanting to get to the Boca to Acre where James and Dory had opened the work, they couldn't get there, and so they decided to go by paddle steamer on the River Perus. It would take a journey of about three weeks to get to the Boca to Acre, but on that first week, Aina Orr became ill, and sadly, on the 4th of June, 1954, at 29 years of age, she passed into the presence of the Lord. The night before Aina left these shores, she sang in her home church, which in those days was Cassare Evangelical Church. O Lord, this world is lost in sin, and few there are who care, many of whom profess your name, no, no burden will help to bear. We need a passion, Lord, for souls, to bring the lost back to thee, our hearts must be stirred until all have heard, at least once of Calvary. Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. Burn and wear out for thee. Don't let me rust or my life be a hindrance, my God, to thee. Take me and all I have, dear Lord, and get me so close to thee till I feel the throb of the great heart of God, and my life burns out for thee. She didn't know that when she sang that hymn that within eight weeks she would burn out. Burned out of a fever and was buried in Labria. And when she was buried in Labria, Fred couldn't speak English, or couldn't speak Portuguese. No one in the town could speak English. And so he got three men to help him carry Ina's coffin to the little graveyard in the outskirts of the town. I was there quite recently. And there they they buried Ina. It was a town that was hostile to the gospel. The bishop of the area, he lived in the town, and he written the history of Labria in which he said, thank God, Protestantes, evangelicals that is, have never come to Labria. They arrived that day, and one of them was in a coffin. The Italian priest in the town did everything to get Fred out of the town. He he got a flight then from Labria to the Boca to Acre. That was in June, but he felt he should go back to Labria in August. When he got back to Labria in August, the Italian priests again were on his tail to get him out of town. But an old Syrian in the town said, listen, this man has more right to live in our town than those priests did. His wife is buried here. And so the Syrian gave to Fred an acre of ground just not too far from the center of town. And on that ground today, I was preaching at the 60th anniversary of the founding of that church just last year. What a testimony it is. As a matter of fact, where that work uh, began with difficulty, Audrey and I worked there back in the early, in the mid-60s, 65 through to 67. And when we got 30, 40 people in the meetings, we thought God was blessing. That was fantastic. It was hard work against persecution in those days. But when I was back there now, 
At the mission, they had 600 attending. On the special occasion outside the church, uh, they had to hold the meetings outside the church on a tropical night when over 2,000 people attended the work. God poured out His blessing. We're looking back, and we say we're laughing and singing and dreaming, for the Lord has done great things for us. I'm going to stop telling the history of the mission from there because thereafter the branches went out into various places, Canotama, Labria, Boca do Acre, Senema, Dorera, Rio Branco, Fejó, Manuel Urbano, Tarawaka, and so it goes on, these places that God was reaching over the years. But, but coming up to date, I was there in January this year for the opening of the brand new church at Hebron. Hebron is a part of Manaus. Manaus today is a city. When we arrived in Manaus in 1965, the population of the town was 200,000. That was a big city to be in the middle of the Amazon. Today, the same city has a population of over two and a half million people. It has become the industrial capital of the north of Brazil. It is in a part of that city, it's throughout that city that we ministered for many years, teaching in three of the Bible colleges in the city. Uh, Audrey and I were involved in establishing three Baptist churches in the city of Manaus. But Fred Orr, he wasn't really for establishing a church. Fred was in great demand to preach missions and conferences here and there. But back home, he, his wife felt they needed to get somewhere for their children. And there wasn't a good church in the area, so they decided to start children's meetings in the garage right at the side of their home in a place called Yapi Inn. Those children's meetings developed until not only Fred's two children, but soon the neighbor's children were coming, and then children from the whole of the neighborhood were coming in until they were getting 50 and 60 children. Fred felt that they had to do something more. And so on a Tuesday night, Fred used to have a, a weekly Bible class that was at our mission headquarters, and he moved it from the mission headquarters down to the garage beside his home. He, he would have up to 30, 40 people attending that Bible class. So good was the growth of that work that they felt they needed to do something more, and so they bought a house in that development, Jappy Ing, uh, knocked down a few walls and turned it into what we would call a mission hall today. God blessed that work, and that work began to grow. As a matter of fact, during those years that we were there, we saw that work grow as from here and there, people were, were, were coming in, and our missionaries were visiting in the district. At that time, Hazel Miskimmon was with us, and Hazel, Hazel was down at the market. She was distributing literature, as she had done for years. She would go at 7 o'clock in the morning and be there to midday. No one ever got by Hazel, a gospel tract and a witness of the gospel. But one day, a young man by the name of Marcus, he came. And when Hazel spoke to him of the gospel, he began to cry. Marcus was 22 years of age. He was a drug addict. Jesus spoke to him of the power of the gospel and what the Lord Jesus could do for him. And before he left Hazel, he was on his knees right there in the public market, and Hazel led him to personal faith in Jesus Christ. It turned out that he came from Japi'in. Hazel introduced him to the church in Japi'in, and at the church while his mother got saved, his sister got saved, his father, Haimundo Nonato, trusted Christ the Savior. And his brother, who back in those days was, a, was quite a worldling with the long hair and earrings and all those sort of things, no, no time for the gospel, and also in drugs, Alain, why, well, he started to attend the early morning prayer meetings. They had early morning prayer meetings at that church every morning from half past six to eight o'clock. And people from the district would drop into the prayer meeting and one by one leading them to Christ. Now, not to, I'll come back to him in a moment, the father, Nonato, not only trusted Christ, today he is one of our evangelists. The long-haired brother, Alain, today is one of our pastors in, in Rio Branco, Acre. At the church in Manaus, as it began to grow, they realized that they'd have to do more than this old house. They'd need to pull it down and build a church because now it was overflowing. We'd started then a Bible institute. I was teaching two or three times a week in another Bible Institute, but I would be teaching in the Hebron Bible Institute every, every afternoon. And so it was, they started to knock down that old building. One day a friend came by and said to a civil engineer, I'd like you to go and meet Fred Orr. He's building a new church, and I'd like you to help him, give him some advice. 
The name of the civil engineer was a man called Herbert. He wasn't a Christian. He was a man who had his own business, was well known throughout Manas. He's, a matter of fact, got a doctorate in, mechanic, in civil engineering. When he got to the site, 30 found Fred Orr at 76 years of age, down in a hole, digging fines up to his eyes in clay. And he looked down and he said, what are you doing down there? And so it was Fred not only met him, but Fred gave his testimony. Fred not only told how his days in Irish League football, how he trusted Christ the Savior, the Lord changed his life, how he met Ina, how Ina died in Labrie, and before he knew it, Herbert was weeping, weeping. He'd come to give advice about the church, but he couldn't stay away from the church. He not only came to help in the building program, he began to attend the meetings, and I remember the night when we baptized 18 people we had to go to another church because there was no baptismal tank in the old mission hall come church. We went to a church called Lagoa Virgin. And, and I, Audrey and I were there that night when 16 people were baptized. Pastor Jose, the leader of our work in Brazil, he, he baptized them. And at the end of it, he said, here's water. Are, are there others who are believers here tonight and you're not, you haven't obeyed the Lord in the waters of baptism? And then he gave a simple word of the gospel. Are there some here this evening who don't know Christ the Savior? Before we knew it, Herbert was out of his seat, running down the aisle, and in a side room, Fred Orr led him to faith in Christ. Before the evening was over, he was baptized that very same evening. That civil engineer attended our Bible Institute. When Fred Orr died, Herbert, that was a civil engineer, got saved that night. He today is the pastor of the Hebron Church. As a matter of fact, it was the Lord's leading because when they built that new church, the new church very soon was small. And so they bought the house next door and they knocked it all down. And, uh, Herbert has overseen the building of a brand new church. I wish you could have been there to see this church now that holds about 350 people packed to capacity. Packed to capacity. And week by week, every weekend, five, six, seven people are coming to Christ. The work is still growing. They've put on a balcony and they don't know what they're going to do next or how it's going to grow next. The only way for it to grow is now got these outlying congregations, little satellite churches throughout the city of Manaus. I'll tell you this, the Lord has done great things for us. Here's a Muskimmon went to be with the Lord and that place at the market was was now vacant for the distribution of literature. So, Raimundo Nonato, that is the father of the boy who knelt on the tiles at the market and accepted Christ. The father also of Pastor Alain, one of our workers in Rio Branco, Acre. Raimundo Nonato is 72 years of age, but every morning he is, he is down at the market at 5.30 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. He stands in the place where Hazel Miskimmon used to stand, and nobody gets by Haimundo without giving a gospel witness, a gospel literature. Every home crusade supply the literature. He's not only known at the market uh, entrance, but he's known by all the people who are at the market, and oftentimes they call for him to go and help them or give counsel. He goes around all the fish stands, all the fishmongers know him. And there at the market, not only people coming in, but people also of those market stalls have trusted Christ the Savior. One lady in particular called him and said, Raimundo, I'd like you to pray for us and for our family. Our family's got great needs. Where do they live? They live across the river. The, the river now is, uh, well, it takes a boat 25 minutes to get across the river. And maybe half an hour on a barge getting across the river. Uh, and then beyond that, into the forest, to a place called Irunduba. That's where they live. Raimundo says, I'll go there on a Saturday morning. And so on a Saturday morning at 6 o'clock, he would be on the barge crossing the river, went to the house. He led the whole family to faith in Christ. Not only led the family, but with that family, he started a little congregation, so much so that he traveled every Saturday morning on the barge. The barge would hold about 20 cars, and with the cars, the drivers and the passengers, and they're a captive congregation. Haimundo's got a beautiful voice, and they're at the front of the barge. He stood up and had an open-air meeting for half an hour. They couldn't go anywhere, the people on the barge. He just sang to them. He's got a beautiful tenor voice. He sang to them, gave his testimony, and gave a simple word of the gospel. 
And thank God on the bars, he's led people to Christ. That little congregation has grown, and just three years ago now, they did away with the bards because they've built a new bridge over the River Negro. The bridge goes for seven kilometers, and now Raimundo on a Saturday morning still goes to Irondoba, but this time he goes by bus. As a matter of fact, he went to the bus owner and he said, listen, I used to have meetings on the bards. Would you mind if I had a meeting on the bus? It takes the bus about 25 minutes to get to Irondoba. And so now, every Saturday morning, Raimundo stands at the front of the bus, sings, gives his testimony, and preaches. Can you imagine that happening here in Northern Ireland? Eh? But there he's at the front of the bus, and the first, son, first Saturday did it. The bus driver got saved. The bus driver now drives a bus every Saturday morning on what is known as the gospel bus, as Raimundo witnesses to the gospel. I'll tell you this. We look back. The Lord has done great things for us. We used to speak of the days of Tom and Ethel Geddes, as it was in those days, of Bill Woods and all the missionaries that we've known, Jack and June Bennett. But all of those missionaries have now been replaced. In those places where we had worked in Tarawaka, Fejo, Manuel Urbano, Sena Madureira, Brazilians are doing the work today. As a matter of fact, I just got photographs last night from the northeast of Brazil where they, yesterday they had a youth conference in Varzia, some of the folk here remember David and Christine going to uh, a little place called Maracajá in Santa Cruz and establishing the congregation there, the little church that is dedicated to Mrs. McConnell. I have preached in that little congregation. But now, why they're coming together, and we've got a whole team of 13 workers out there serving the Lord in the northeast of Brazil. And yesterday they had the conference in this little place called Varzia. And I remember that work starting. It was difficult. It was hard. Uh, I'll tell you this. It's, it's hats off to the path. Gratitude for all that God has done. But before I finish, let me return to this little psalm. Where do we go from here? God's work, my friend, is built on the promises of God. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't have time to tell you of the entrance that Lucy Marr, who's got a team of 35 teachers in Rio Branco, Acre, teaching the Word of God in all of the schools, the high schools of Rio Branco, Acre, introducing them, teachers and students, to the CEF correspondence course that they're filling. As a matter of fact, Lucy Marr went to one school, and the, one of the teachers went to the head mistress and said, I object to this woman coming in. She, she has no curriculum. She's, Lucy Marr went to her and said, Madam, my curriculum is the Bible. I just teach the Bible. You come to my classes. So the headmistress thought, the only way to, for the school and the teachers to understand Lucy Marr and what she's teaching is for all of the teachers to come to her class. So all of the teachers came, and Lucy Marr taught all of the teachers. And the woman who objected, she trusted Christ the Savior. She now is one of the teachers reaching into those schools, 35 teachers reaching into the schools, 2,500 boys and girls every week hearing the gospel. Oh, the Lord has done great things for us. But let me leave you with a little psalm. If you look in your King James Bible, you will find that the word doubtless is at the heart of the psalm, and it balances the whole psalm. It is the key to that last verse. For it says, he who goes, he shall doubtless come again. My friend, can I say, today is a day for going. Remember the parable Jesus said, go work this day in my vineyard. My son, go work this day in my vineyard. Why, go is in the gospel. This is the day for going across the street and across the world. But the Bible says, he who goes, he shall doubtless come again. My friend, what a day that's going to be. I was preaching last night about heaven, and what a day it's going to be when they will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'll tell you this, eternity will be wonderful. But, but it's not only he who goes shall doubtless come. He who goes weeping shall doubtless come again rejoicing. Don't you see the counterpart? There is a doubtless for the weeping. Oh, my friend, I'll tell you this. God's work is not easy, not anywhere. 
Those who are in God's work know that we are up against it. The Bible says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. But I'll tell you this, the powers of the enemy work against us. And oftentimes, there are tears. How often I've been with missionaries saying goodbye to loved ones. And perhaps they know that they'll never see them again. They're sacrificed. How often I've been with, with some of our missionaries when they're passing away into eternity because of illnesses that they contract. God's work is not easy. Not easy for the Macombs when they sent their children away back to Ireland and not see them for nine years. Not easy for us when we had to send our children to a boarding school because of the work. It's not easy. But... He who goes weeping, he shall doubtless return. How? Rejoicing. Why? Because the Bible tells us God keeps all of our tears in a bottle. And said the Apostle Paul, the light affliction of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the eternal weight of glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, what a day that's going to be. For the going today, there's returning tomorrow. For the weeping today, there'll be rejoicing tomorrow. And he who goes weeping, listen to it, bearing precious seed. That's the whole objective of mission. The whole objective of mission, my friend, is to get this word into all of the world. Sowing the good seed. And what does it say? He who goes weeping, he who goes will doubtless return. He who weeps will doubtless rejoice. And he who goes sowing, he shall return rejoicing, reaping, bringing in the sheaves. What a day that's going to be. I say this as I finish. We thank God over the years in Actory Gospel Mission. We've had medical work. As a matter of fact, Dr. Woods, who's just in Ireland at this moment, I'll be seeing him on Tuesday again. Do Dr. Woods has dedicated all of his life to medicine. Over 25,000 people are healed from leprosy today because of Bill Woods. Over a thousand people have got their sight back again because of Bill Woods. One man, uh, he, he had been blind for nine years until Bill operated on him. And when they took the swabs off the next day, the man could see. He was so excited. Imagine not seeing for nine years. He was so excited. He said to Bill, I can't wait till the afternoon. Bill says, why? What's wrong? He said, well, my wife's coming. I haven't seen my wife for nine years. Bill says, well, if you don't like what you see, I can't reverse the operation again. <laughs> but you can operate on the body, as Dr. Woods has done, as Dr. Geddes has done, but one day, my friend, this body will return to corruption. We thank God for schools. We've, we've had schools over the years in Labria, Canotama, Senema Derrera, Boca do Acre. Schools. You can educate the mind, and that's wonderful. But one day the mind can fall into senility, but he that winneth souls. The Bible says he shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Hats off to the past in gratitude. Coats off to the future. For he who goes shall doubtless return. He who goes weeping shall doubtless return rejoicing. And he who goes weeping bearing precious seed shall doubtless return rejoicing, reaping with the great Lord of the harvest. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank Thee today for our blessed Savior. We thank You for Calvary and the great price of our redemption. We thank You for this wondrous message of the gospel. Our Father, we pray that You will bless us today. Bless this congregation. We thank Thee for it. For those who have gone from here to preach thy word, give to us, our Father, not only vision and burden, but the grace to do what you would have us do. So accept our thanks now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.